Okay, the law was given Israel to prove mankind's utter sinfulness and helplessness. This is indicated in Paul's own experience in Romans chapter 7. Read Romans 7, 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. Or would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, You shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind, for apart from the law, sin is dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. And this commandment, which was to be result in life, proved to result in death for me. It's already going to die, but what kind? He realized spiritual death. Wow. Gehenna. Hell. For sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and, and through it, killed me. That the law was holy and righteous it is obvious, as stated by Paul in Romans 7, 12 to 13, as follows. So then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Therefore, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? May it never be. Rather, it was sin, in order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good, so that through the commandment, sin would be utterly become utterly sinful. You realize you're accountable to God all of a sudden. After, apart from the law, the life, remember Paul bragged about being a Pharisee of Pharisees. Apart from the life of Jesus Christ in his perfect and sinless humanity, there has been universal failure to keep such laws as God has revealed to mankind. The law was never given as a means for salvation or justification. The law became a curse to Israel, bringing them condemnation and death, and to all mankind, by the example of her failure, God's law, Israel, God's chosen people, fail, the whole world, wow. And they can see her behavior was worse than some of the Gentile nations. The beneficial effect of the law is to drive Israel to Christ as the only Savior and mediator. Look at Romans 3, 19 and 20, and as well Galatians 3, 11 and 24. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because of the works of law, no article there, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through law, any rules of coming human behavior, comes the knowledge of sin, especially the Mosaic law. Take a look at Romans 3.20. In any case, take a look at Romans 5.20 before we get to look at 3.20. The law came in so that the transgression would increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Notice that the law increased sin, revealing the sinless of mankind, sinfulness of mankind that represented to mankind what is holy and righteous as the God of Israel is holy and righteous. If the law was given, point F, to shut up everyone under sin, everyone, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to, to i.e. fulfilled in, those, Jew and Gentile, all mankind who believe. The law thus became our tutor, guardian trainer, to lead us to Christ, so that we may be justified by faith. Galatians 3, 22 to 24. But the scripture has shut up everyone under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. You have to realize you're a sinner before you can think that you can get salvation, and then you don't look to do your own works but look to the works of Christ on the cross. But before this faith in Jesus came, we all mankind were being guarded under law, having been shut up to the faith in Jesus, which was later to be revealed by his appearance in history with his atonement for sins on the cross. Before this, you had the, the scriptures, and you had Abraham, Isaac, and Jake, and his the example of his uh, uh, justification Genesis, in Genesis 15, 6. Therefore, the law has become our tutor, guardian, trainer, to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. The law was given to make a person sin more. Wow, really? Yes, Romans 5.20. The law came in so that the transgression would increase. Because it wasn't done on purpose, but mankind is so sinful, he gets told what to do and he does it all the more. Or even gets told what he should do and shouldn't do, and he didn't even know to do either way 
who didn't even come to his mind, but now he's told he's going to sin all the more. But where sin increased for the believer, grace abounded all the more. Remember, Romans 6, 1, for what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? The believer. Grace covered it all the more. So the law was given to serve as a wall of partition between Jew and Gentile until it, the law, was abolished. Christ on the cross. Ephesians 2, 14 and 15. For he himself is our peace. Christ is our peace, having made the both groups, Jew and Gentile, into one in the body of Christ, who those who are believers, and having abolished the dividing wall of the barrier of enmity between us. Having abolished the enmity between both groups in his flesh, having annulled the law of the commands contained in ordinances, that the two groups he might create in himself into one new man making peace. Ephesians 2, 14 to 15 then goes on to declare that Christ has made, in the sense of created, both groups, Jewish believers and Gentile believers, into one group, which is neither Jew nor Gentile, but one new creation in Christ Jesus. Christ having abolished in his flesh the dividing wall, literally, the middle wall of the partition in the sense of the dividing wall, that is the barrier, the Mosaic law, the enmity between the two groups, resulting in no godly reason for there to be enmity between one another in this temporal life, nor in eternity, especially in the body of Christ. Neither Jew nor Gentile believer in Christ Jesus can claim superiority over the other. Both must rely on the grace of God for the temporal and eternal life through faith in his Son. The law was given to serve as a, an example of the righteousness of God by which Christ did live and thus qualify himself to his perfect sinless humanity without a sin nature to die in payment for the sins of the whole world in order to provide the gift of his righteousness to those who trust alone in him alone for eternal life. So the law represents the righteousness of God, the standard of righteousness that God demands for eternal life out of all of us and for a proper relationship with him in the temporal life in every statute. When you fall short, remember 1 John 1, 7. If we walk in his light, not according to it, the blood of Jesus purifies us from all unrighteousness. Realize we fall short. That's 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us those sins that we confess and purify us from all unrighteousness and we're declared as righteous as the law is. See? But it's by the grace of God. Galatians 3.21 Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For there was given a law which could have given life. Truly righteousness would have been by the law. We had laws before the Mosaic law. Moses came along, but Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then through Moses, we got the law, which stipulates more specifically Galatians 3.21 stipulates that the Mosaic law is not against the promises of God, so if keeping a law could have been given eternal life, but it is man that is not capable, truly righteous, would have been the Mosaic law indicating that the law is righteous. Well, let's take a look at Romans 7.12. All these passages that Pastor Prince could have been consulting. Uh, maybe his study here would have been a little bit longer, but a whole lot more informative. Romans seven twelve. So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. This implies that the character of the provisions of the Mosaic law is an absolutely righteous one, every statute. Romans two twenty B. The Jews verses fourteen, seventeen, eighteen, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and of the truth. Notice that it is stipulated in Romans 2.20b. You Jews have the law, in the law, the embodiment of knowledge and truth, the foundation for all knowledge and truth, and of course God being creator, the embodied, to make concrete and perceptible. This is not to say that the Mosaic law contains all knowledge and truth. The most applicable definition of the word embodiment here is that the law makes all knowledge and truth concrete and perceptible, the basis, the foundation implying that it is the source upon which knowledge and truth is built, God being creator. Since then, God is righteous and knowledge and truth, and the law comes from God, and then the knowledge and truth which the law embodies is righteous, hence the law is the embodiment of God's righteousness. The Jews were given the law by God in order to represent him to the world. 
So the Jews evidently are to represent God relative to the law being given to them by God and their obedience to it as God's chosen people. Well, we got that excerpt. Galatians 3, Pastor Prince, a great thing to teach just right through it. And then when people go back with your teaching in mind, which came, comes directly from the Word of God with no additions or subtractions, now they can go back to the Bible and become students of the Word and not students of Pastor Joseph Prince. You're the purveyor, the conveyor. Observe and report, my pastor, uh, my uh, professor, somewhere used to say. Observe and report. So, in any case, based on the terms of the Mosaic Law, the Mosaic Covenant, if you kept God's law, you were blessed. But if you didn't, you were cursed and condemned with the death sentence hanging over your head. No, that's not always the case. Not all violations, I say, of the Mosaic Law were death sentences. Consult your Bible and read the above excerpt again on Galatians 3. Stick to what the Bible says and stop editorializing. I mean, you don't tithe enough or you cheat a little bit on your tithing, you're not going to get stoned to death. Maybe you won't have a good season next year with your crops or herds. J.P., the fact is that under the Old Covenant, the Mosaic Law, no man could keep the law perfectly. That is why soon after the law was given, God made a provision of animal sacrifices so that a man's curse, condemnation, and death sentence could be transferred to the sacrificial bull or lamb. I don't see that either. It just depends. Animal sacrifices, uh, there's a particular one, once a year, Look forward to Christ's sacrifice. But uh, if you are liable for being stoned to death or, or violating the Sabbath, they didn't just go up to the altar and sacrifice a lamb. Sometimes they just check out the rocks. And depending upon the grace and forgiveness of the individual or whatever, the, uh, the Pharisees, uh, you would be stoned to death. But they wouldn't uh, automatically say, well, let's find a bull or a lamb. Everybody would then violate the law. Well, I just, I got a whole big herd. I can do whatever I want. And I, and I won't be liable to punishment under the most, this doesn't make any sense. Not true. Check your Bible. Capital offenses were not transferred to animals. <clears throat> People were stoned to death, even in Jesus' time. No one went and got an animal. Attempts were made on his life. And Paul, on Jesus' life, They didn't go get a, so Jesus made an attempt, he blasphemed God or something, they, you know, they accused him of that, because he claimed to be God's son. Uh, they didn't go get an animal, they tried to shove him off the cliff. Oh, yeah, let's not shove him off the cliff, let's find, do you, do you have a lamb, Jesus? That made any sense. And Paul's, he was stoned to death by the keepers of the law, the Pharisees. They did not sacrifice animals in their stead. So anyway, here's Joseph Prince again. This is a picture of Jesus on the cross, at the cross. When John the Baptist saw the Lord Jesus on the banks of the Jordan River, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John 1.29. So even in the law, we see that man's only hope to be right with God once and for all is Christ. True grace teaching esteems the moral excellence of the law, but it will also make clear to us that no man can be justified by keeping the Ten Commandments so that we see our need for Christ. Well, here's my point. You must know that the law has 613 commandments, not just 10. So the animal, the sacrifices of animals were pictures, foreshadowings of Christ's all-time sacrifice for the sins of all mankind. All right, we're here. I'm going to got to reduce this font size here. Switching back and forth the computers, they're not exactly compatible with one another. All right, that was easy. Not, uh, we got 30 seconds here. An animal sacrifice was performed once a year for that year's sins by the nation Israel with a view to the once for all time sacrifice of Jesus Christ. See, one, an animal sacrifice performed once a year, the year's sins of the nation of Israel, Hebrews 9 1 to 10. You can read up on that. In addition to the yearly setting aside of sins by the nation Israel, this yearly sacrifice was meant to look forward to and 